Real estate investing can bring big reward and big risks. So know your risks. Welcome to the Real Estate Risk Report, the show for real world insight on real estate investment risk. Now, here's your host, Lance Peterson. Thank you for joining the Real Estate Risk Report. I'm your host, Lance Peterson. So today I have with me Savannah Arroyo. She is also known as the Net Worth Nurse. How are you doing this morning, Savannah? Hi, I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So I think we, we caught Savannah before she goes and does her day job here the uh, as, as a nurse. Um, so it's a, an early recording of the Real Estate Risk Report this morning. So why don't you share with us, I think you've got a pretty interesting story as to how you got into the the real estate investing side of things. I think your story probably resonates with, you know, quite a few of our audience members, but you know, what, what attracted you to, to real estate investing? Yes, I, um, well, first off, like you said, I'm a nurse. I grew up in Sacramento. I went to Sacramento state university, got my nursing degree there and then worked in a couple different hospitals and a couple different specialties. And then, uh, went back to school and got my master's degree in nursing leadership and administration. And then right now I oversee multiple departments at a hospital down here in LA. Um, my husband and I started looking into different ways to invest and kind of create different um, income streams when I was on maternity leave with my second daughter. I was at home just kind of researching ways that we could kind of create more wealth for ourselves and kind of some passive income. Uh, being a stay at home or being at home with my daughter just made me realize I didn't want to be working every day, a slave to work until I was 65. I wanted to start using our money to create some income for us to make it work for us. And we stumbled upon real estate and dove uh, headfirst into all sorts of podcasts and books and different strategies in there of ways to invest in real estate. And we started off buying single family homes and then shortly after I moved into multifamily syndications, really just because we wanted to scale. And then after we kind of learned about multifamily, we realized they were higher returns with a lot less risk. So then we switched into multifamily and that's what we're working on now. Yeah, very good. So with, in terms of like the, the net worth nurse platform, is, is that more of like, I mean, is your, your other than investing obviously, but is that sort of an educational platform that you're you're building in terms of so just just curious kind of on your your angle and like how you're how are you you know educating other people out there or what's the what's the thought process behind that yeah definitely so after we did our first syndication deal we did it with friends and family they were investing with us they just knew that we were starting to invest in real estate they trust my my husband and myself and they wanted to invest with us and so we had friends and family join in on that first syndication deal and they had a lot of questions and basic questions about even understanding how a syndication works uh the um, different things that we look at when we're analyzing a deal. And so then after we did that first deal, we started realizing that we needed to create a platform of educational resources and tools for our investors to refer them to. Because there's a lot of people who know of real estate, but have no idea what a multifamily syndication is or a syndication in general, and just kind of explaining what that process looks like and how easy it is as a passive investor to jump in on those deals. So creating doodle videos, and like I said, blogs, I'm on a YouTube channel, just creating a bunch of different resources sources that we can direct investors to when we start doing our next deal to kind of explain what it looks like. And then they have that foundation of knowledge of a multifamily syndication. And then we're really just going over our specific deal at the time and kind of what the numbers look like and re- the ter- returns look like for that deal. Got it. Yeah. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. The, the educational, you know, lead with education, um, I think is a, is the winning formula. You got a better, you know, the more educated consumer and, they understand what they're doing and, and uh, you get better engagement and, and those things. So, so for, for you guys, where, so it's multifamily, mm-hmm. what markets are you looking to invest? I mean, I know you guys live in Southern California, but where are you looking to do deals in Southern California? Are there other markets that you're looking at? Yes, we never 
I mean, we briefly looked in SoCal for deals to kind of make it work just because it was appealing to invest in our own backyard. But it's uh, you have to make different strategies work here in L.A. People make it work, but they're just doing a completely different strategy. And we were looking specifically at um, value add multifamily deals and um, wanting to exit around five five ish years. Uh, We were looking in Atlanta, Georgia, because that's where our single family homes are. We still look there. Um, and then we also look in Oregon, we look in Reno, Nevada and New Mexico. Uh, the thing is when we look at each market, we have completely different parameters for each market. Uh, they're, they're very different in Georgia. Um, it's getting pretty competitive. So the prices are starting to rise. We're looking like 50 to a hundred units, strong value add over there in Reno. It's very low inventory, but a very strong market. So we're looking kind of for more new build, new construction type properties over there, there, uh, Oregon we've seen kind of just has a lot of hidden gems and we have created an amazing relationship with a broker that's giving us amazing deal flow up there. So that's really been where a lot of our time and energy is focused. Um, but it really, it just depends on the market. And then when we're working with brokers on kind of creating that deal flow, we just get very specific about what we're looking for so that by the time they start sending us some deals, we're able to act very quickly on them. Yeah. So yeah, let's just hone in on the Oregon market since that's where I live. So for for you then, what what are the are we talking like fifty units, a hundred units? Like what what size? You know, where do you guys? What would that look like? Like when you're if I'm a broker, what are you saying? Hey, this is kind of the stuff we're looking for. Yes. So mid range, um, smaller to mid range, we're doing like 20 to a hundred, mm-hmm. uh, strong value add. We have a few sub markets that we look up, up, up there. Um, like Roseburg is kind of a sub market. Um, Portland's really the most well known, but the, the prices are kind of starting to rise around that city. So more looking at the strong working class sub markets in Oregon has really been, um, ideal for us. Yeah. So when you when you guys look at doing value add, I, I get that it differs from market to market. But since you're not, you know, these these assets aren't in your area. How, how do you guys handle that if you're executing a value add strategy? Um, is it more light value add, or what? You know, what are you guys looking to to do to a unit? How much are you putting in per unit, and and how do you oversee all that from afar? Yeah, we have an amazing team built up in Oregon and we knew, especially doing value add. So the deals we look at in Oregon are really just mismanaged properties that they were kind of sat on the back burner for different owners, previous owners, and they just didn't pay a lot of attention to them. Uh, They're just like a neglected property. I mean, they're everywhere. So below market rents, kind of some um, cap not major CapEx um, expenses that are out of control, but just some stuff that we do to kind of bring down the expenses to kind of increase that NOI for the building. So um, we have an amazing property manager up there and that relationship is so very important when we're doing these value add deals. That was something that we took a lot of time and energy and effort to really vet out a great property manager, not one that just had great experience that had um, really good insight into our business strategy with the specific building, but also someone we just had a re- great relationship with because it's someone that we're going to be working with for, you know, five it, five years per property. So we really just want to make sure the relationship's a good fit. And so far, we've had amazing luck with the uh, property managers. I know a lot of people kind of struggle with that aspect, but we just really had a great interview, a set of interview questions that we use to kind of vet out these property managers. And then we show them our underwriting and we're kind of like, Hey, are we going to be able to raise rents this much every year in this market? And they tell us very quickly, yes or no, because they have the one we're using. She has a, a great experience there. So she'll be able to look at our numbers and tell us exactly how much we're going to be able to raise rents, what we're going to be able to decrease expenses. And she has great insight into our business plan. Yeah, that's a good, that's a great point. I mean, like finding the, I mean, because on the surface, I mean, it's kind of like how I view trying to find a sponsor, right? There's like every website more or less says the same thing. Um, you know, so if you're a passive investor looking for like, Hey, who's, who's doing deals, you know, it's like everyone's one way or another sort of, it's hard to tell the difference. Right. And I think property managers to me seem to be the same. You go to their websites, they all, 
like what what makes you different, right? And then, uh, and it's hard to tell like what you know what what they do. Are you right? like are you just single family rentals for mom and pop investors? Are you so how, how do you guys go about that? I mean, it sounds like you're sort of a method to your madness, but like how does that how does that search look? And then when you do narrow it down, I'm I'm curious as to what these questions are and. Because a lot of people, yeah. like you said, they, the knock on these property managers, your interests aren't necessarily completely aligned. Mm-hmm. You know, they're 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 doing property management for a bunch of different owners, and you know, they're getting, you know, they're just not as their interests aren't as aligned as they are with the owners, right? Yeah. And so, you know, the the costs and the the markups and those sorts of things. So, I'm just curious how you guys go about vetting those property managers. Yeah, definitely. And that's something, I mean, kind of on a side note, we learned with our first contractor that we hired up there, it just was not a good fit. There was a lot of kind of lack in communication of just, we weren't seeing eye to eye on kind of expectations of when things were supposed to be getting done. And it just felt like such a struggle to have these conversations with our previous contractor. And we're spending so much money doing a lot of work on this specific project. And it was so, it was just very difficult and stressful to kind of not have the responses we were looking for and just not have the communication style. And it made that process very painful. And we ended up kind of we're cutting ties with that contractor and moving forward, working with someone else. So those relationships are so important to your business plan. So for the property manager, it was really just, I mean, we originally Googled property managers in this specific sub market. Um, there was like, I think almost five and we were looking kind of through their portfolios where they were managing properties and we called them and maybe like two of them I was able to kind of cut off initially from the start like and I didn't really kind of like how the the conversation was going I mean all of us we have different personalities that appeal to each of us and even when you're saying when people are vetting out sponsors like it all kind of looks the same on a website but once you start having conversations with people it's kind of like oh, okay, I kind of like vibe with this person. I feel like kind of what they're saying. I feel like it'd be kind of a Mm -hmm. good good relationship. You just naturally kind of get those feelings when you have conversations with people. So it was having multiple conversations with these property managers and originally having the questions of like, what are your years is years of experience? How many properties do you manage in this market? What's your experience raising rents? Like what's your experience with these expenses? And the property manager we ended up choosing when we were talking about this property that we were under contract with, she knew exactly where the building was. She was born and raised in North Bend, Oregon, which is a small, a little mm-hmm. coastal town up there. Born and raised there, managed tons of units over there, over 20 years managing properties. When I told her the building, she was like, oh, I know exactly where that's at. She knew the breakdown of the units better than I did. Like she was like, oh, that's a two bedroom, one bath. There's two studios. Like she knew the building, which was so awesome. And then when we were talking about the rent, she was like, oh, I know that building has below market rents. And I know the guy who owns it and he's Mm -hmm. out of state. Like she had so much insight into the market and just kind of having follow up conversations with her of like, yeah, we can do like, she was stoked off our business plan of like, yeah, let's raise rents. Like we can totally do it within this amount of time. Like all for sure. I've seen, I've overseen major construction. Like I don't have any contractors to give you. Like that was kind of one thing that we were really looking for a property manager that worked well with a contractor team. And she didn't have that, but she was like, people are really booked out here. Like I won't really necessarily be able to help you out with that. So then we started kind of going down that route of vetting out contractors, but just kind of having multiple conversations. And then as we had them, we felt very comfortable working with her to oversee this business plan. Yeah. And then that, so when, so when you engage someone like that, then is the, when it comes down to like negotiating what the fee is and those sorts of things, I mean, with the smaller, I guess it, it's kind of like depends upon how big the, the property is. Cause in this case, it sounds like there's probably not an on site property manager. It, no. Yeah, that's right. So it's just more of like, like 8% of gross rents and, and those sorts of things. Yeah. So in Oregon, it's 6%, which yeah. really shocked us when we heard that. Um, But, and that's like no extra turnover fee. There's no additional fees. It's just Mm -hmm. flat out 6%. And that really shocked us compared to some of the other markets we were looking at. But she said that's just going right in Oregon. And for the sub market that she's in, that's just kind of what 
she sees. And we've seen that as we've continued to do deals. But um, yeah, that that was kind of shocking in Oregon. But it just goes to show that every market's so different. So you kind of got to start talking to people as you're doing your underwriting to make sure that all your numbers are correct because they don't apply necessarily from market to market. Yeah. So when you guys are structuring these syndications, then um, what is what does that typically look like in terms of to the investors? Like, are you doing some sort of preferred return with some sort of split above that, or you know, how how are you structuring these syndications? Yes, we have not done the preferred return yet. We always kind of vet it out and see how it works with our numbers beforehand. It's something our investors that we're working with aren't necessarily very set on having. Um, Although if that kind of changes down the road, that's something we would kind of adjust in our uh, investment opportunities moving forward. But um, we really just kind of do a standard 80-20 split, 80% going towards the investors. We try and exit around three to five years. Um, If it's a very strong value add, we can maybe exit in three years and get really good returns, but they are lower cash flowing. So we look at different opportunities and we just really communicate with our investors what it looks like and why the numbers look like this and kind of they appeal to different people. Um, But that's kind of, we're very transparent with our numbers. We should go over all the underwriting and kind of what we're looking at, our reasoning with the numbers. Um, We do all our underwriting very conservatively. So we kind of go and explain where we're getting our numbers from and what it kind of looks like over the lifetime of the uh, business plan. But um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So long-term goals then for, is it eventually to get to the point where you don't have to work full-time anymore or what's the, what's sort of the, the long-term goal for, you know, building, building this out? Yes. The long-term goal is just to have the choice, really the choice to not want to work. I mean, the goal is to get my husband working on real estate full time within the next three to five years. That's really big for us. That was kind of the main goal. I love my career in nursing so much. And I mean, there was a lot of reasons why I went into nursing to begin with. And I've kind of always had my eyes set on like a CNO role at a hospital. And I've kind of just continued to climb through the corporate ladder and moved into various leadership and management positions within um, healthcare and the organization I'm with specifically. So I kind of want to see that out. I've spent a lot of time and effort in my career. And so I, I love what I do. I love working with people. Um, I know throughout the pandemic, a lot of people have been working from home and I just can't even imagine, like, I love going into work every day and having those relationships with my staff and the physicians and the patients. So that's not necessarily something I want to give up, but I want to have the option and, Um, I think that's a big motivation and reason of why I've kind of started gearing more towards medical professionals of like sharing all the different opportunities of real estate investing, because you'd be surprised how many high income earners are kind of trapped in their jobs or like, you know, at Mm -hmm. the age of 65 and can't necessarily retire. And it's because they didn't necessarily start investing with their money and start making their money work for them. And they're just kind of in this position where they're a slave to the job. And I just, my husband and I never really wanted that. We wanted to be able to have this time freedom with our daughters if we wanted like five years down the road to Mm -hmm. like be able to stay in Hawaii for a month out of the year and kind of work remotely and be with our daughters and and kind of go down that route of having more time freedom. That was very important for us. Yeah, I agree. I think that is the the thing that's finally setting in, right, is that, you know, society used to have a very pension driven, right, your retirement sort of set and then they'd flip to sort of, okay, you're on your own, 401ks, IRAs. Well, now we're starting to see that that many people just didn't really get that part right, you know, so they, here they are 20 years later, it's not quite what they'd hope, like you said, and then they end up being trapped because they have to keep working well beyond retirement age, you know, 65. And, and so now you're seeing this, it's sort of the realization set in that, okay, I've got to control, like I'm in charge of my own personal wealth and I, yeah. I need to do something about it. And so now you see a lot of people educating themselves and trying to figure out how to create additional income streams, which is great. And I think that's really the benefit of, syndications, the ability to get in and, you know, have these additional income streams. So 
wanted to hit kind of last topic to hit on here is the, so you mentioned like in your husband's case, you know, trying to get to the point where he's full time. Was that part of the strategy? Cause like does one, I mean, I'm assuming you can't really qualify as a real estate professional cause you're busy, you know, doing yeah. surfing stuff. Was that part of it as well was to say, how do we get it to the point where we meet that sort of IRS designation of one of you being a real estate professional? Yes, that is a huge, huge motivation behind it. Um, and we kind of figured for now that's fine. But as we continue to grow our portfolio after like three to five years, it was going to be very important to have a full time real estate professional. And we think regardless of like the amount of deals and time and effort that we're putting into starting to grow this wealth for us, that will be in a position where that can happen. But regardless, the tax incentives for making that happen is huge. Yeah, is that and I suppose is that part of sort of what you'll be teaching the other medical professionals? I mean, it seems like that's the, the thing. I mean, in the medical profession, a lot of high income earners, but if they can get at least their spouse or, I mean, obviously if they're single, it's, it's difficult to, to qualify, but it's a great way to offset that. If one of the, if one of the, the, uh, the couple can become sort of that real estate professional. Yeah. <clears throat> Definitely. Yeah, it's it's so key and kind of just really having those conversations with people and kind of how you were mentioning before about people transitioning away from like the 401k IRA accounts. That's such it's still such a hard topic to breach with people because they're so I mean, it, that's very ingrained in us since mm -hmm. like we first get a job and we get set up with these accounts and it's really just like pushed onto us by the institutions. I mean, I get emails now from Fidelity. That's who my retirement account set up for. It's like, you need to start investing more, save for your future. And it's just crazy that we're in this mindset of we need to be saving all this money for when we're 65. Like that's the end goal. Like it just, for me, it was like, okay, well, that's not what I want to do with my money. I want to start investing my money to start receiving some of those rewards now. Like, I mean, it is good to keep it kind of snowballing as much as you can and kind of live below means to make that happen. Happen, but at the same time, I wanted to be in a position where I had more control of my money. And under the CARES Act, we pulled a lot out of our retirement accounts really just to have penalty free, which was so amazing. And something I really tried to educate a lot of people on was the ability to do that penalty free pull for a pull during 2020 under the CARES Act for COVID. But just being able to now have control of that money. But some people are terrified of that concept, even though it's, I mean, essentially the same risk you're getting almost double the rewards or you know growth within that portfolio if you start pushing it towards real estate so mathematically it just makes so much sense but there's just that fear that's almost ingrained and kind of a going against the norm yeah and, and yeah i agree and i think that that's like in my own right I, I think that there's there's more to it right than i mean i think you said like you said it's that american dream you know everything that comes along with that and just the the change but i also think that it is it's just it's a lot of it comes down to one it's intimidating real estate it, it, it's they they all know that a bunch of people made a bunch of money it's like it's not like that's in dispute um it's just that it's intimidating because all the people that are in the business use big you know they use lingo and it's and then yeah. you hear the horror stories i mean a lot of developments that go, you know, sideways and, you know, and you, you lose your money or whatever. And then not to mention yeah. from, you know, my passion is just, I think that there's, it's the fraud angle. I mean, pe people, you know, they're basically putting money into someone who they don't exactly completely know, right? Like right. they're not doing the deal. And so it's like, I don't know, you seem like you know what you're doing, but, yeah. um, <laughs> and, you know, and so that's, that's a real thing, right? Is that there's the opportunities that end up crossing your desk are from people that, you know, you don't know enough about it yourself to know whether or not they're any good at what they do. And, yeah. and so you've got that problem. And it's like, are these good guys or bad guys? I don't know. You know, and right. how do I know that? How do I know that they're doing everything that they're telling me that they're doing? So the, the inherent opaqueness of it is, yeah, I don't know. I've invested in something and there's a property up in Oregon and I, I, I'm getting checked. So I guess it's going OK. But that could also mean that, you know, they're just, you know, it's a Ponzi scheme or whatever. So it's yeah. just. Yeah. Those are the things from my standpoint is that it's great that there's interest and I'm, and that's why I'm so thrilled that there's more people like you that are out there like educating because like without yeah. the education, people aren't going to do it, right? Like if you don't understand things, by and large, people aren't going to get involved. So the more they can understand, okay, this makes sense to me. It's not that complicated. Mm -hmm. 
And then we can take some of those other things off the table, like assurances that these people aren't crooks and assurances that whatever yeah. their claims are purporting are legit, not made right. up, and all the money's going where it should go. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, okay, now I can start to get into this and more freely allocate capital into the space. And that, you know, I think that when we fast forward 10, 15, 20, 20 years from now, most buildings we drive by will be, will have been syndicated in some way. Meaning it's not just, yeah. you know, one family that owns all the properties. It's like there's 50 different families that end up owning that through syndication. And that's pretty exciting because that means that now everyone's getting a piece of that sort of, you know, income stream. And now you've got optionality. If you love your job, great. Keep doing it. But if you didn't want to do it anymore, like you said, you want to go to Hawaii, then you can do that too. Right. Yes. And that's right now what people don't have that optionality. So it's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, love, love seeing it. Uh, where can people find you? Yes, the net worth nurse. So you can find me under the net worth nurse on all social media handles. So that's Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Instagram, the net worth nurse. That's also my website. My email is Savannah at the net worth nurse. I love connecting with other people interested in real estate. If anything I've said is remotely interesting to you, please reach out. I would love to chat. Cool. Well, thank you for your time, Savannah. You have a great day and uh, we'll be in touch. Awesome. Thank you so much.